In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the friendship that developed between Adams and Jefferson. But before we look at some of the specific aspects of their relationship, let's take a look at the background to this. You have to understand that during the days of Adams and Jefferson, especially when they were both serving as president or even prior to that, when they were serving in the cabinet of Washington, they, there existed at this time that great party divide. This was the rise of the first political parties or groups in the history of America, specifically the Federalist, which was essentially the party of Adams and Washington and Hamilton, and then those Democrat Republicans, who will alternately call Democrats Republicans because they essentially were both at the time. And that was, of course, the party of men like Thomas Jefferson or James Madison, for example. Well, even though there was this incredible divide, even though these two men should have, in many ways, been bitter enemies, it's remarkable that they had a relationship in the first place. It's also remarkable because both these men who served under Washington, uh, you would think that they would have been heavily involved in politics to such an extent that they would have eagerly sought the presidency after Washington resigned after a second term. In fact, you would often think, compared to today's modern politics, that back in this day, the way that men sought the presidency was the same as our own. It was with uh, great zeals, with great desire, and a whole lot of money, and a whole lot of support, and sometimes lots of nasty attacks. There were elections like that, but the Founding Fathers had a very curious idea. In fact, the Founding Fathers, including John Adams' own son, John Quincy Adams, believed that if you were someone who sought the presidency, if you had desire to be president of the United States, then that desire alone made you unfit for the office. They saw the office as such a huge responsibility and such a huge burden that others should elect you without you ever even throwing your name into the hat, so to speak. And so both Adams and Jefferson, we can say, really didn't seek the presidency. Now, it's true, others sought the presidency for them, Hamilton for Adams initially, and later Madison for Jefferson, but neither one really wanted that position. Part of what's interesting about these men, though, of course, is their friendship. Uh, they were both a part of that Brotherhood of 76, as it's sometimes called. They were both signers of the Declaration of Independence. They both served faithfully on the Continental Congress. But what's most incredible is they were founders there at the beginning when everything was uncertain. In other words, they put their lives, they put the stake of their reputations, their entire fortune, everything that they held and loved dear, they put it all on the line for the sake of independence when it was entirely unknown if they would actually end up with those things at the end of the war. And so that kind of risk together, that kind of need to fight together and really fight against a common enemy, that is what really made these men close, and Adams and Jefferson especially. They themselves were a bit of an odd couple. Adams came from New England, came from Massachusetts, came from a Puritan background, had a very northern mindset, all about hard work. Whereas Jefferson came from the gentleman class of Virginia, he was a planter. He had slaves that allowed the manual work on his fields, and he had a very southern worldview on other issues. Adams was known for being physically short and fat, whereas Jefferson was rather tall and slender. Adams was losing his hair. Jefferson had kind of fiery red hair. Adams was the kind of guy who liked to correct your grammar, who liked to get into debates with you. He was rather aggressive in his speech. Jefferson also cared deeply about ideas, but he was more elusive. He was more careful with what he said, and he might lead you on somewhere or another, but never quite reveal exactly what he thought about something until he was certain that he could win the argument. In fact, they referred to each other as different trees. Adams was the oak, uh, that great unwavering tree, and Jefferson was the willow, that beautiful tree that often resides by bodies of water and uh, flows nicely through the breeze. And so these two men formed a remarkable partnership. Now what's interesting about both these men is they were the thinkers. They were really the intellectuals behind something like the Declaration. In fact, Benjamin Rush, one of the other founding fathers, said that Adams and Jefferson were like the North and South Pole for that whole Continental Congress. 
They did, of course, serve as members of Congress together. They were both on the committee to write the Declaration of Independence. So even though Jefferson is the one who largely created that document and wrote those words, most of the ideas would have come from that great mind of Adams. Not only that, they suffered through the entire war together, but they also became ambassadors to England, to the court of King George III, their former enemy, after the war. And it was there that publicly, one day at court, King George III stood up when Adams and Jefferson entered the room, and then he publicly turned his back on the men, refusing to even hear them speak, while all of his courtiers laughed at Adams and Jefferson. That kind of public humiliation, which made the papers of the day and made Adam and Jefferson look like a fool uh, wherever they went in Europe, brought them closer together. And so now that we understand kind of the basis of their friendship, we're going to take a look at the lives of Adams and Jefferson leading up to their role as president. But we'll start with Adams, the oak. Adams was born in Braintree, Massachusetts in the year 1735. And early on, his family sent him to Harvard. That was what you did. If you lived in the area of Massachusetts, you typically went to Harvard. That was your university. And you learned the languages to be accepted there. He was sent to Harvard specifically to become a minister of the gospel. But the thing about Adams was that Adams was never quite certain that Christ actually could do the claims that he claimed in the New Testament. In other words, he wasn't quite certain that Christ was indeed God, or that Christ had indeed actually taken away the sins of the world, which is why Adams later in life turned to becoming a Unitarian, which they simply believe that Christ is not God. So with understanding that he could not become a minister of the gospel, John Adams chose to be a lawyer instead and was quite uh, a capable and engaging lawyer himself. He eventually married the love of his life, a woman by the name of Abigail Smith, and their letter correspondence is rather legendary. In fact, they used to write letters to each other two to three times a week, even though it often took well over a week for their letter to actually arrive to the other. So they would write letters, not knowing what the other had responded to it yet, and continue writing letters to each other. That's how much they actually missed each other. In fact, Adams always thought of home as his base. That, that was always what he wanted to return to, like some of the other great founding fathers. In fact, he was never away from home for more than three months at a time and was known for loving his family and his home and especially his books. He and Jefferson shared that common passion for reading alike. In fact, what's interesting about Adams is he much preferred those things to, say, politics. He used to say things like this. He said, one useless man is a shame, two is a law firm, three or more is a Congress. In other words, he firmly believed that politics, as valuable as it was, right government, as necessary as it was, it wasn't the final thing at the end of the day. It wasn't what actually made everything work. It was only a part of the larger picture. Still, as a young man in 1765, he joined those other patriots of Massachusetts to oppose the Stamp Act for being an unrighteous attempt to take power in the New World. But curiously enough, when the Boston Massacre occurred, Adams, whose cousin Sam Adams was violently opposed to the British at this point and wanted to see their regiments leave, John Adams, the lawyer, took a different position. He realized that while the Boston Massacre was indeed wrong, and while it was created by a bad policy on the part of the British, he also recognized that the men who had committed the massacre, those British soldiers and officers, needed a lawyer to actually represent them justly and fairly in court. And so Adams did something very unpopular. He became the defense attorney for those men during their trial. And he did as good and as fine a job as he could in their defense as he probably would have done in their prosecution. It wasn't because he somehow was after fame. It was just that Adams had a very strong idea of principle and he was willing to sacrifice himself for the sake of what was right. It's rather remarkable. Eventually, he was sent to the Continental Congress, where he was known as the Atlas of Independence. What that meant was, if you had a question about government, you could essentially ask Adams the question, and he would kind of look through his search engine mind and find the information for you. 
In fact, later on in his life, they played a game with him, kind of like Stump the Professor, where a group of his friends or a group of experts in different fields, whether it be history or language or surgery or natural history, etc., would ask him questions about things that he probably wouldn't know about that they were experts in, and then he was always somehow able to give a right answer. Even though he admitted in his own papers, he often had no idea what the actual answer was. In other words, he was a man who brilliantly understood principles and was often able to guess very well how things worked. He wrote a great work called Thoughts on Government, and this Thoughts on Government actually became the basis for most of the state constitutions as the states declared independence from Britain. He himself would write the Massachusetts State Constitution, and during the Constitutional Convention for our federal document, he wrote a great work called The Defense of the Constitution, in which he disagreed with certain key aspects of the Constitution, but he still believed that it should be ratified because he believed it was the best thing for the United States at the time. Now, of course, as we mentioned in a previous lesson, when Washington was president, John Adams was vice president. And he called that position the most insignificant office ever devised by mankind because he believed he only essentially had one job, or, well, two jobs, really. One was to pass tie-breaking votes in the Senate, should there be a tie, and the other was to stay alive should the president die. Now, what's interesting about Adams is he actually had the most active tie-breaking career of any vice president. He actually got to pass a tie-breaking vote some 31 times while he was vice president, which is actually the most in our entire history. Still, George Washington chose to let Adams out of the cabinet. In other words, Washington believed that the vice president should not be directly engaged in the decisions of the president because the vice president should be ready to take over at any moment. And in Washington's mind, that meant that he must come in with his own notions. And so Adams always felt as if he was kind of the black sheep of the cabinet. He was never really allowed in on the decision-making moments, which was something that made him feel underappreciated, which is why he would often in his letters to Abigail complain about people, especially people like Hamilton or even Washington himself. But the thing about Abigail is Abigail always brought him back to reality. She always kind of cooled him down. But what's incredible about Adams and Jefferson was that Jefferson kept Adams sharp. The two men who greatly admired and loved each other were able to spar with each other. They were able to have incredible dialogues and incredible debates that always held the admiration and respect mutually between the two men, but also kept them going to such a degree that it made their careers remarkable. We'll take a look at the career of Jefferson in the next lesson.